Chapter 17 Effect a Regression People who have experienced a certain kind of pleasure in the past will try to repeat or relive it. The deepest rooted and most pleasurable memories are usually those from earliest childhood and are often unconsciously associated with the parental figure. Bring your targets back to that point by placing yourself in the Oedipal Triangle and positioning them as the needy child. Unaware of the cause of their emotional response, they will fall in love with you. Alternatively, you too can regress, letting them play the role of their protecting, nursing parent. In either case, you are offering the ultimate fantasy, the chance to have an intimate relationship with mommy or daddy. Son or daughter. The Erotic Regression As adults, we tend to overvalue our childhood. In their dependency and powerlessness, children genuinely suffer. Yet, when we get older, we conveniently forget about that and sentimentalize the supposed paradise we have left behind. We forget the pain and remember only the pleasure. Why? because the responsibilities of adult life are a burden so oppressive at times that we secretly yearn for the dependency of childhood, for that person who looked after our every need, assumed our cares and worries. This daydream of ours has a strong erotic component, for the child's feelings of being dependent on the parent is charged with sexual undertones. Give people a sensation similar to that protected dependent feeling of childhood and they will project all kinds of fantasies onto you, including feelings of love or sexual attraction that they will attribute to something else. We won't admit it, but we long to regress, to shed our adult exterior and vent the childish emotions that linger beneath the surface. Early in his career, Sigmund Freud confronted a strange problem. Many of his female patients were falling in love with him. He thought he knew what was happening. Encouraged by Freud, the patient would delve into her childhood, which of course was the source of her illness or neuroses. She would talk about her relationship with her father, her earliest experiences of tenderness and love, and also of neglect and abandonment. The process would stir up powerful emotions and memories. In a way, she would be transported back into her childhood. Intensifying this effect was the fact that Freud himself said little and made himself a little cold and distant, although he seemed to be caring. In other words, quite like the traditional father figure. Meanwhile, the patient was lying on a couch in a helpless or passive position so that the situation duplicated the roles of parent and child. Eventually, she would begin to direct some of the confused emotions she was dealing with toward Freud himself. Unaware of what was happening, she would relate to him as to her father. She would regress and fall in love. Freud called this phenomenon transference, and it would become an active part of his therapy. By getting patients to transfer some of their repressed feelings onto the therapist, he would bring their problems into the open, where they could be dealt with on a conscious level. The transference effect was so potent, though, that Freud was unable to move his patients past their infatuation. In fact, transference is a powerful way of creating an emotional attachment, the goal of any seduction. The method has infinite applications outside psychoanalysis. To practice it in real life, you need to play the therapist, encouraging people to talk about their childhood. Most of us are only too happy to oblige. And our memories are so vivid and emotional that a part of us regresses just in talking about our early years. Also, in the course of talking, little secrets slip out. We reveal all kinds of valuable information about our weaknesses and our mental makeup, information you must attend to and remember. Do not take your target's words at face value. They will often sugarcoat or over-dramatize events in childhood but pay attention to their tone of voice, to any nervous tics as they talk, and particularly to anything they don't want to talk about, anything they deny or that makes them emotional. Many statements actually mean their opposite. 
Should they say they hated their father, for instance, you can be sure that they're hiding a lot of disappointment, that they actually loved their father only too much, and perhaps never quite got what they wanted from him. Listen closely for recurring themes and stories. Most important, learn to analyze emotional responses and see what lies behind them. While they talk, maintain the therapist's pose, attentive but quiet, making occasional non-judgmental comments. Be caring yet distant, somewhat blank, in fact, and they will begin to transfer emotions and project fantasies onto you. With the information you've gathered about their childhood and the trusting bond you have forged, you can now begin to affect the regression. Perhaps you have uncovered a powerful attachment to a parent, a sibling, a teacher, or any early infatuation, a person who casts a shadow over their present lives. Knowing what it was about this person that affected them so powerfully, you can now take over that role. Or perhaps you have learned of an immense gap in their childhood, a neglectful father, for instance. You act like that parent now, but you replace the original neglect with the attention and affection that the real parent never supplied. Everyone has unfinished business from childhood, disappointments, lacks, painful memories. Finish what is unfinished. Discover what your target never got, and you have the ingredients for a deep-rooted seduction. The key is not just to talk about memories. That is weak. What you want is to get people to act out in their present old issues from their past without their being aware of what is happening. The regressions you can affect fall into four main types. The infantile regression. The first bond, the bond between a mother and her infant, is the most powerful one. Unlike other animals, human babies have a long period of helplessness during which they are dependent on their mother, creating an attachment that influences the rest of their lives. The key to affecting this regression is to reproduce the sense of unconditional love a mother has for her child. Never judge your targets. Let them do whatever they want, including behaving badly. At the same time, surround them with a loving attention. Smother them with comfort. A part of them will regress to those earliest years when their mother took care of everything and rarely left them alone. This works on almost everyone, for unconditional love is the rarest and most treasured form. You don't even have to tailor your behavior to anything specific in their childhood. Most of us have experienced this kind of attention. Meanwhile, create atmospheres that reinforce the feeling you're generating. Warm environments, playful activities, bright, happy colors. The Oedipal Regression After the bond between mother and child comes the Oedipal Triangle of mother, father, and child. This triangle forms during the period of the child's earliest erotic fantasies. A boy wants his mother to himself. A girl does the same with her father, but they never quite have it that way, for a parent will always have competing connections to a spouse or to other adults. Unconditional love has gone. Now, inevitably, the parent must sometimes deny what the child desires. Transport your victims back to this period. Play a parental role. Be loving, but also sometimes scold and instill some discipline. Children actually love a little discipline. It makes them feel that the adult cares about them. And adult children, too, will be thrilled if you mix your tenderness with a little toughness and punishment. Unlike infantile regression, Oedipal regression must be tailored to your target. It depends on the information you have gathered. Without knowing enough, you might treat a person like a child, scolding them now and then, only to discover that you're stirring up ugly memories. They had too much discipline as a child. Or you might stir up memories of a parent they loathed, and they will transfer those feelings to you. Do not go ahead with the regression until you've learned everything you can about their childhood, what they had too much of, what they lacked, and so on. If the target was strongly attached to a parent, but that attachment was partially negative, the Oedipal regression strategy can still be quite effective. 
We always feel ambivalent toward a parent. Even as we love them, we resent having had to depend on them. Don't worry about stirring up these ambivalences, which don't keep us from being tied to our parents. Remember to include an erotic component in your parental behavior. Now, your targets are not only getting their mother or father all to themselves, they're getting something more, something previously forbidden, but now allowed. The Ego Ideal Regression As children, we often form an ideal figure out of our dreams and ambitions. First, that ideal figure is the person we want to be. We imagine ourselves as brave adventurers, romantic figures. Then, in our adolescence, we turn our attention to others, often projecting our ideals onto them. The first boy or girl we fall in love with may seem to have the ideal qualities we wanted for ourselves, or else may make us feel that we can play that ideal role in relation to them. Most of us carry these ideals around with us, buried just below the surface. We are secretly disappointed in how much we have had to compromise, how far below the ideal we've fallen as we have gotten older. Make your targets feel they're living out this youthful ideal and coming closer to being the person they wanted to be. And you will affect a different kind of regression, creating a feeling reminiscent of adolescence. The relationship between you and the seduced is in this instance more equal than in the previous kinds of regressions, more like the affection between siblings. In fact, the ideal is often modeled on a brother or sister. To create this effect, strive to reproduce the intense, innocent mood of a youthful infatuation. The Reverse Parental Regression Here, you are the one to regress. You deliberately play the role of the cute, adorable, yet also sexually charged child. Older people always find younger people incredibly seductive. In the presence of youth, they feel a little of their own youth return, but they are in fact older and mixed into the invigoration they feel in young people's company is the pleasure of playing the mother or father to them. If a child has erotic feelings toward a parent, feelings that are quickly repressed, the parent must deal with the same problem in reverse. Assume the role of the child in relation to your targets, however, and they get to act out some of those repressed erotic sentiments. The strategy may seem to call for a difference in age, but this is actually not critical. Marilyn Monroe's exaggerated little girl qualities work just fine on men her age. Emphasizing a weakness or vulnerability on your part will give the target a chance to play the protector. Some examples. Number one. The parents of Victor Hugo separated shortly after the novelist was born in 1802. Hugo's mother, Sophie, had been carrying on an affair with her husband's superior officer, the general. She took the three Hugo boys away from their father and went off to Paris to raise them on her own. Now the boys led a tumultuous life, featuring bouts of poverty, frequent moves, and their mother's continued affair with the general. Of all the boys, Victor was the most attached to his mother, adopting all her ideas and pet peeves, particularly her hatred of his father. But with all the turmoil in his childhood, he never felt he got enough love and attention from the mother he adored. When she died in 1821, poor and debt-ridden, he was devastated. The following year, Hugo married his childhood sweetheart, Adele, who physically resembled his mother. It was a happy marriage for a while, but soon Adele came to resemble his mother in more ways than one. In 1832, he discovered that she was having an affair with the French literary critic Saint-Beuve, who also happened to be Hugo's best friend at the time. Hugo was a celebrated writer by now, but he wasn't the calculating type. He generally wore his heart on his sleeve. Yet, he couldn't confide in anyone about Adele's affair. It was too humiliating. His only solution was to have affairs on his own with actresses, courtesans, married women. Hugo had a prodigious appetite, sometimes visiting three different women in the same day. 
Near the end of 1832, production began on one of Hugo's plays, and he was to supervise the casting. A 26-year-old actress named Juliette Drouet auditioned for one of the smaller roles. Normally quite adroit with the ladies, Hugo found himself stuttering in Juliet's presence. She was quite simply the most beautiful woman he had ever seen, and this and her composed manner intimidated him. Naturally, Juliet won the part. He found himself thinking about her all the time. She always seemed to be surrounded by a group of adoring men. Clearly, she wasn't interested in him, or so he thought. One evening, though, after a performance of the play, he followed her home to find that she was neither angry nor surprised. Indeed, she invited him up to her apartment. He spent the night, and soon he was spending almost every night there. Hugo was happy again. To his delight, Juliette quit her career in the theater, dropped her former friends, and learned to cook. She had loved fancy clothes and social affairs, Now, she became Hugo's secretary, rarely leaving the apartment in which he had established her and seeming to live only for his visits. After a while, however, Hugo returned to his old ways and started to have little affairs on the side. She did not complain, as long as she remained the one woman he kept returning to. And Hugo had, in fact, grown quite dependent on her. In 1843, Hugo's beloved daughter, died in an accident, and he sank into a depression. The only way he knew to get over his grief was to have an affair with someone new. And so, shortly thereafter, he fell in love with a young, married aristocrat named Leonie Doni. He began to see Juliette less and less. A few years later, Leonie, feeling certain she was the preferred one, gave him an ultimatum. Stop seeing Juliette altogether, or it was over. Hugo refused. Instead, he decided to stage a contest. He would continue to see both women, and in a few months, his heart would tell him which one he preferred. Leonie was furious, but she had no choice. Her affair with Hugo had already ruined her marriage and her standing in society. She was dependent on him. Anyway, how could she lose? She was in the prime of her life, whereas Juliette had gray hair by now. So she pretended to go along with this contest, but as time went on, she grew increasingly resentful about it and complained. Juliette, on the other hand, behaved as if nothing had changed. Whenever he visited, she treated him as she always had, dropping everything to comfort and mother him. The contest lasted several years. In 1851, Hugo was in trouble with Louis Napoleon, the cousin of Napoleon Bonaparte and now the president of France. Hugo had attacked his dictatorial tendencies in the press, bitterly and perhaps recklessly, for Louis Napoleon was a vengeful man. Fearing for the writer's life, Juliette managed to hide him in a friend's house and arranged for a false passport, a disguise, and safe passage to Brussels. Everything went according to plan, Juliette joined him a few days later, carrying his most valuable possessions. Clearly, her heroic actions had won the contest for her. And yet, after the novelty of Hugo's new life were off, his affairs resumed. Finally, fearing for his health and worried that she could no longer compete with yet another 20-year-old coquette, Juliette made a calm but stern demand. No more women she was leaving him. Taken completely by surprise, yet certain that she meant every word, Hugo broke down and sobbed. An old man by now, he got down on his knees and swore on the Bible and then on a copy of his most famous novel, Les Miserables, that he would stray no more. Until Juliette's death in 1883, her spell over him was complete. Interpretation Hugo's love life was determined by his relationship with his mother. He never felt she had loved him enough. Almost all the women he had affairs with bore a physical resemblance to her. Somehow, he would make up for her lack of love for him by sheer volume. When Juliette met him, she couldn't have known all this, but she must have sensed two things. 
He was extremely disappointed in his wife, and he had never really grown up. His emotional outbursts and his need for attention made him more a little boy than a man. She would gain ascendancy over him for the rest of his life by supplying the one thing he had never had, complete, unconditional mother love. Juliette never judged Hugo or criticized him for his naughty ways. She lavished him with attention. Visiting her was like returning to the womb. In her presence, in fact, he was more a little boy than ever. How could he refuse her a favor or ever leave her? And when she finally threatened to leave him, he was reduced to the state of a wailing infant crying for his mother. In the end, she had total power over Unconditional love is rare and hard to find, yet it is what we all crave since we either experienced it once or wish we had. You don't have to go as far as Juliette Drouet. The mere hint of devoted attention, of accepting your lovers for who they are, of meeting their needs, place them in an infantile position. A sense of dependency may frighten them a little, and they may feel an undercurrent of ambivalence, a need to assert themselves periodically, as Hugo did through his affairs. But their ties to you will be strong, and they will keep coming back for more, bound by the illusion that they are recapturing the mother love they had seemingly lost forever, or never had. Number two. Around the turn of the 20th century, Professor Muth, a schoolmaster at a college for young men in a small German town, began to develop a keen hatred of his students. Muth was in his late 50s and had worked at the same school for many years. He taught Greek and Latin and was a distinguished classical scholar. He had always felt a need to impose discipline, but now it was getting ugly. The students were simply not interested in Homer anymore. They listened to bad music and only liked modern literature. Although they were rebellious, Moot considered them soft and undisciplined. He wanted to teach them a lesson and make their lives miserable. His usual way of dealing with their bouts of rowdiness was sheer bullying, and most often, it worked. One day, a student Moot loathed, a haughty, well-dressed young man named Loman, stood up in class and said, I can't go on working in this room, Professor. There is such a smell of mud. Mud was the boy's nickname for Professor Moot. The professor seized Loman by the arm, twisted it hard, then banished him from the room. He later noticed that Loman had left his exercise book behind, and thumbing through it, he saw a paragraph about an actress named Rosa Frölich. A plot hatched in Moot's mind. He would catch Loman cavorting with this actress, no doubt a woman of ill repute, and would get the boy kicked out of school. First, he had to find out where she performed. He searched high and low, finally finding her name up outside a club called the Blue Angel. He went in. It was a smoke-filled place full of working-class types. He looked down on Rosa was on stage. She was singing a song. The way she looked everyone in the audience in the eye was rather brazen, but for some reason, Moot found this disarming. He relaxed a little, had some wine. After her performance, he made his way to her dressing room, determined to grill her about Loman. Once there, he felt strangely uncomfortable, but he gathered up his courage accused her of leading schoolboys astray and threatened to get the police to close the place down. Rosa, however, was not intimidated. She turned all of Moot's sentences around. Perhaps he was the one leading boys astray. Her tone was cajoling and teasing. Yes, Lohmann had brought her flowers and champagne, so what? No one had ever talked to Moot this way before. His authoritative tone usually made people give way. He should have felt offended. She was low class and a woman, and he was a schoolmaster. But she was talking to him as if they were equals. Instead, however, he neither got angry nor left. Something held him to stay. Now, she was silent. She picked up a stocking and started to darn it, ignoring him. His eyes followed her every move, particularly the way she rubbed her bare knee. 
Finally, he brought up Loman again and the police. You've no idea what this life's like, she said. Everyone who comes here thinks he's the only pebble on the beach. If you don't give them what they want, they threaten you with the police. I certainly regret having hurt a lady's feelings, he replied sheepishly. As she got up from her chair, their knees rubbed and he felt a shiver up his spine. Now she was nice to him again and poured him some more wine. She invited him to come back, then left abruptly to perform another number. The next day, he kept thinking about her words, her looks. Thinking about her while he was teaching gave him a kind of naughty thrill. That night, he went back to the club, still determined to catch Loman in the act, and once again found himself in Rosa's dressing room, drinking wine and becoming strangely passive. She asked him to help her get dressed. That seemed quite an honor, and he obliged her. Helping her with her corset and her makeup, he forgot about Loman. He felt he was being initiated into some new world. She pinched his cheeks and stroked his chin and occasionally let him glimpse her bare leg as she rolled up a stocking. Now, Professor Moot showed up night after night, helping her dress, watching her perform, all with a strange kind of pride. He was there so often that Loman and his friends no longer showed up. He had taken their place. He was the one to bring her flowers, pay for her champagne, the one to serve her. Yes, an old man like himself had bested the youthful Loman, who thought himself so suave. He liked it when she stroked his chin, complimented him for doing things right, but he felt even more excited when she rebuked him, throwing a powder puff in his face or pushing him off a chair. It meant she liked him. And so, gradually, he began to pay for all her caprices. It cost him a pretty penny, but kept her away from other men. Eventually, he proposed to her. They married, and scandal ensued. He lost his job, and soon all his money. Finally, he landed in prison. To the very end, however, he could never get angry with Rosa. Instead, he felt guilty. He had never done enough for her. Interpretation Professor Moot and Rosa Fröhlich are characters in the novel The Blue Angel, written by Heinrich Mann in 1905, and later made into a film starring Marlena Dietrich. Rosa's seduction of Moot follows the classic Oedipal regression pattern. First, the woman treats the man the way a mother would treat a little boy. She scolds him, but the scolding is not threatening. It's tender and has a teasing edge. Like a mother, she knows she's dealing with someone weak who cannot help his naughty behavior. She mixes plenty of praise and approval in with her taunts. Once the man begins to regress, she adds physical excitement, some bodily contact to excite him, subtle sexual overtones. As a reward for his regression, the man may get the thrill of finally sleeping with his mother. But there is always an element of competition which the mother figure must heighten. The man gets to possess her all on his own, something he could not do with father in the way, but he first has to win her away from others. The key to this kind of regression is to see and treat your targets as children. Nothing about them intimidates you no matter how much authority or social standing they have. Your manner makes it clear that you feel you are the stronger party. To accomplish this, it may be helpful to imagine or visualize them as the children they once were. Suddenly, powerful people don't seem so powerful and threatening when you regress them in your imagination. Keep in mind that certain types are more vulnerable to an Oedipal regression. Look for those who, like Professor Moot, seem outwardly the most adult, straight-laced, serious, a little full of themselves. They are struggling to repress their regressive tendencies, overcompensating for their weaknesses. Often those who seem the most in command of themselves are the ripest for regression. In fact, they are secretly longing for it because their power, position, and responsibilities are more a burden than a pleasure. Number three. 
Born in 1768, the French writer François René de Chateaubriand grew up in a medieval castle in Brittany. The castle was cold and gloomy, as if inhabited by the ghosts of its past. The family lived there in semi-seclusion. Chateaubriand spent much of his time with his sister Lucille, and his attachment to her was strong enough that rumors of incest made the rounds. But when he was about 15, a new woman named Sylphide entered his life, a woman he created in his imagination. A composite of all the heroines, goddesses, and courtesans he had read about in books. He was constantly seeing her features in his mind and hearing her voice. Soon, she was taking walks with him, carrying on conversations. He imagined her innocent and exalted, yet they would sometimes do things that were not so innocent. He carried on this relationship for two whole years until finally he left for Paris and replaced Sylphide with women of flesh and blood. The French public, weary after the terrors of the 1790s, greeted Chateaubriand's first books enthusiastically, sensing a new spirit in them. His novels were full of windswept castles, brooding heroes and passionate heroines. Romanticism was in the air. Chateaubriand himself resembled the characters in his novels, and despite his rather unattractive appearance, women went wild over him. With him, they could escape their boring marriages and live out the kind of turbulent romance he wrote about. Chateaubriand's nickname was The Enchanter, and although he was married and an ardent Catholic, the number of his affairs increased with the years. But he had a restless nature. He traveled to the Middle East, to the United States, all over Europe. He couldn't find what he was looking for anywhere, and not the right woman either. After the novelty of an affair wore off, he would leave. By 1807, he had had so many affairs and still felt so unsatisfied that he decided to retire to his country estate called Vallée aux Loups. He filled the place with trees from all over the world, transforming the grounds into something out of one of his novels. There, he began to write the memoirs that he envisioned would be his masterpiece. By 1817, however, Chateaubriand's life had fallen apart. Money problems had forced him to sell Valéolou. Almost 50, he suddenly felt old. His inspiration dried up. That year, he visited the writer Madame de Stal, who had been ill and was now close to death. He spent several days at her bedside along with her closest friend, Juliette Recamier. Madame Recamier's affairs were infamous. She was married to a much older man, but they had not lived together for some time. She had broken the hearts of the most illustrious men in Europe, including Prince Metternich, the Duke of Wellington, and the writer Benjamin Constant. It had also been rumored that despite all her flirtations, she was still a virgin. She was now almost 40, but she was the type of woman who seems youthful at any age. Drawn together by their grief over de Stal's death, she and Chateaubriand became friends. She listened so attentively to him, adopting his moods and echoing his sentiments, that he felt that he had at last met a woman who understood him. There was also something rather ethereal about Madame Recamier. Her walk, her voice, her eyes. More than one man had compared her to some unearthly angel. Chateaubriand soon burned with the desire to possess her physically. The year after their friendship began, she had a surprise for him. She had convinced a friend to purchase Ballet au Loup. The friend was away for a few weeks, and she invited Chateaubriand to spend some time with her at his former estate. He happily accepted. He showed her around, explaining what each little patch of ground had meant to him, the memories the place conjured up. He felt youthful feelings welling up inside him, feelings he had forgotten about. He delved further into the past, describing events in his childhood. At moments, walking with Madame Recamier and looking into those kind eyes, he felt a shiver of recognition, but he could not quite identify it. All he knew was that he had to go back to the memoirs that he had laid aside. 
I intend to employ the little time that is left to me in describing my youth, he said, so long as its essence remains palpable to me. It seemed that Madame Recamier returned Chateaubriand's love, but as usual, she struggled to keep it a spiritual affair. The enchanter, however, deserved his nickname. His poetry, his air of melancholy, and his persistence finally won the day, and she succumbed, perhaps for the first time in her life. Now, as lovers, they were inseparable. But as always with Chateaubriand, over time, one woman was not enough. The restless spirit returned. He began to have affairs again. Soon, he and Recamier stopped seeing each other. In 1832, Chateaubriand was traveling through Switzerland. Once again, his life had taken a downward turn, only this time he truly was old, body and spirit. In the Alps, strange thoughts of his youth began to assail him, memories of the castle in Brittany. Word reached him that Madame Recamier was in the area. He hadn't seen her in years, and he hurried to the inn where she was staying. She was as kind to him as ever. During the day, they took walks together, and at night, they stayed up late talking. One day, Chateaubriand told Recamier he had finally decided to finish his memoirs, and he had a confession to make. He told her the story of Sylphide, his imaginary lover when he was growing up. He had once hoped to meet a Sylphide in real life, but the women he had known had paled in comparison. Over the years, he'd forgotten about his imaginary lover, but now he was an old man, and he not only thought of her again, he could see her face and hear her voice. And with those memories, he realized that he had, in fact, met Sylphide in real life. It was Madame Recamier. The face and voice were close. More important, there was the calm spirit, the innocent, virginal quality. Reading to her the prayer to Sylphide he had just written, he told her he wanted to be young again, and seeing her had brought his youth back to him. Reconciled with Madame Recamier, he began to work again on the memoirs, which were eventually published under the title Memoirs from Beyond the Grave. Most critics agreed that the book was his masterpiece. The memoirs were dedicated to Madame Recamier, to whom he remained devoted until his death in 1840. Interpretation All of us carry within us an image of an ideal type of person whom we yearn to meet and love. Most often, the type is a composite made up of bits and pieces of different people from our youth and even of characters in books and movies. People who influenced us inordinately, a teacher, for instance, may also feel. The traits have nothing to do with superficial interests. Rather, they are unconscious, hard to verbalize. We searched hardest for this ideal type in our adolescence when we were more idealistic. Often our first loves have more of these traits than our subsequent affairs. For Chateaubriand, living with his family in their secluded castle, his first love was his sister Lucille, whom he adored and idealized. But since love with her was impossible, he created a figure out of his imagination who had all her positive attributes nobility of spirit, innocence, courage. Madame Recamier could not have known about Chateaubriand's ideal type, but she did know something about him well before she ever met him. She had read all of his books, and his characters were highly autobiographical. She knew of his obsession with his lost youth, and everyone knew of his endless and unsatisfying affairs with women, his hyper-restless spirit. Madame Recamier knew how to mirror people, entering their spirits, and one of her first acts was to take Chateaubriand to Valleolou, where he felt he had left part of his youth. Alive with memories, he regressed further into his childhood to the days in the castle. She actively encouraged this. Most important, she embodied a spirit that came naturally to her, but that matched his youthful ideal, innocent, noble, Kind. The fact that so many men fell in love with her suggests that many men had the same ideals. Madame Recamier was Lucille Sylphide, 
It took him years to realize it. But when he did, her spell over him was complete. It is nearly impossible to embody someone's ideal completely. But if you come close enough, if you evoke some of that ideal spirit, you can lead that person into a deep seduction. To affect this regression, you must play the role of the therapist. Get your targets to open up about their past, particularly their former loves, and most particularly, their first love. Pay attention to any expressions of disappointment, how this or that person did not give them what they wanted. Take them to places that evoke their youth. In this regression, you are creating not so much a relationship of dependency and immaturity, but rather the adolescent spirit of a first love. There is a touch of innocence to the relationship. So much of adult life involves compromise, conniving, and a certain toughness. Create the ideal atmosphere by keeping such things out, drawing the other person into a kind of mutual weakness, conjuring a second virginity. There should be a dreamlike quality to the affair, as if the target were reliving that first love, but couldn't quite believe it. Let all of this unfold slowly, each encounter revealing more ideal qualities. The sense of reliving a past pleasure is simply impossible to resist. Number four. Sometime in the summer of 1614, several members of England's upper nobility, including the Archbishop of Canterbury, met to decide what to do about the Earl of Somerset the favorite of King James I, who was 48 at the time. After eight years as the favorite, the young Earl had accumulated such power and wealth and so many titles that nothing was left for anyone else. But how to get rid of this powerful man? For the time being, the conspirators had no answer. A few weeks later, the king was inspecting the royal stables when he caught sight of a young man who was new to the court the 22-year-old George Villers, a member of the lower nobility. The courtiers who accompanied the king that day watched the king's eyes following Villers and saw with what interest he asked about this young man. Indeed, everyone had to agree that he was a most handsome youth with the face of an angel and a charmingly childish manner. When news of the king's interest in Villers reached the conspirators, they instantly knew they had found what they had been looking for a young man who could seduce the king and supplant the dreaded favorite. Left to nature, though, the seduction would never happen. They had to help it along. So without telling Villers of their plan, they befriended him. King James was the son of Mary, Queen of Scots. His childhood had been a nightmare. His father, his mother's favorite, and his own regents had all been murdered. His mother had first been exiled, later executed. When James was young, to escape suspicion, he played the part of a fool. He hated the sight of a sword and could not stand the slightest sign of argument. When his cousin, Queen Elizabeth I, died in 1603, leaving no heir, he became King of England. James surrounded himself with bright, happy young men and seemed to prefer the company of boys. In 1612, his son, Prince Henry, died. The king was inconsolable. He needed distraction and good cheer, and his favorite, the Earl of Somerset, was no longer so young and attractive. The timing for a seduction was perfect. And so the conspirators went to work on Villers under the guise of trying to help him advance within the court. They supplied him with a magnificent wardrobe, jewels, a glittering carriage, the kind of things the king noticed. They worked on his riding, fencing, tennis, dancing, his skills with birds and dogs. He was instructed in the art of conversation, how to flatter, tell a joke, sigh at the right moment. Fortunately, Villers was easy to work with. He had a naturally buoyant manner, and nothing seemed to bother him. That same year, the conspirators managed to get him appointed the royal cupbearer. Every night, he poured out the king's wine so that the king could see him up close. After a few weeks, the king was in love. 
The boy seemed to crave attention and tenderness, exactly what he yearned to offer. How wonderful it would be to mold and educate him, and what a perfect figure he had. The conspirators convinced Villers to break off his engagement to a young lady. The king was single-minded in his affections and could not stand competition. Soon James wanted to be around Villers all the time, for he had the qualities the king admired, innocence and a light-hearted spirit. The king appointed Villers gentleman of the bedchamber, making it possible for them to be alone together. What particularly charmed James was that Villers never asked for anything, which made it all the more delightful to spoil him. By 1616, Villers had completely supplanted the former favorite. He was now the Earl of Buckingham and a member of the King's Privy Council. To the conspirators' dismay, however, he quickly accumulated even more privileges than the Earl of Somerset had done. The king would call him sweetheart in public, fix his doublets, comb his hair. James zealously protected his favorite, anxious to preserve the young man's innocence. He tended to the youth's every whim, in effect, became his slave. In fact, the king seemed to regress. Whenever Steenie, his nickname for Villers, entered the room, he started to act like a child. The two were inseparable until the king's death in 1625. Interpretation We are most definitely stamped forever by our parents in ways we can never fully understand. But the parents are equally influenced and seduced by the child. They may play the role of the protector, but in the process, they absorb the child's spirit and energy relive a part of their own childhood. And just as the child struggles against sexual feelings toward the parent, the parent must repress comparable erotic feelings that lie just beneath the tenderness they feel. The best and most insidious way to seduce people is often to position yourself as the child. Imagining themselves stronger, more in control, they will be lured into your web. They will feel they have nothing to fear. Emphasize your immaturity, your weakness, and you let them indulge in fantasies of protecting and parenting you. A strong desire as people get older. What they do not realize is that you are getting under their skin, insinuating yourself. It is the child who is controlling the adult. Your innocence makes them want to protect you, but it is also sexually charged. Innocence is highly seductive. Some people even long to play the corrupter of innocence. Stir up their latent sexual feelings, and you can lead them astray with the hope of fulfilling a strong yet repressed fantasy, sleeping with the child figure. In your presence, too, they will begin to regress as well, infected by your childish, playful spirit. Most of this came naturally to Villers, but you will probably have to use some calculation. Fortunately, all of us have strong childish tendencies within us that are easy to access and exaggerate. Make your gestures seem spontaneous and unplanned. Any sexual element of your behavior should seem innocent, unconscious. Like Villers, don't push for favors. Parents prefer to spoil children who don't ask for things, but invite them in their manner. Seeming non-judgmental and uncritical of those around you, will make everything you do seem more natural and naive. Have a happy, cheerful demeanor, but with a playful edge. Emphasize any weaknesses you might have, things you cannot control. Remember, most of us remember our early years fondly, but often, paradoxically, the people with the strongest attachment to those times are the ones who had the most difficult childhoods. Actually, circumstances kept them from getting to be children. So they never really grew up, and they long for the paradise they never got to experience. James I falls into this category. These types are ripe targets for a reverse regression. Reversal To reverse the strategies of regression, the parties to a seduction would have to remain adults during the process. This is not only rare, it is not very pleasurable. 
Seduction means realizing certain fantasy. Being a mature and responsible adult is not a fantasy, it is a duty. Furthermore, a person who remains an adult in relation to you is harder to seduce. In all kinds of seduction, political, media, personal, the target must regress. The only danger is that the child, wearying of dependence, turns against the parent and rebels. You must be prepared for this, and unlike a parent, never take it personal.